Hello, everyone, and welcome back to our Sama Saturday, coming together every weekend to share goodness and wholeness about holistic well being for our animals and very oftentimes ourselves. Today is definitely one of those conversations, and we're so excited about today because, you know, we love to talk about how we can help our animals most naturally and what really is the foundation of healing. And um, we've had many different discussions around topics, but we always come back to the same topic of the microbiome, the gut, the health of that internal seat of wellness that is inside of every single living being. And that is our topic today. And we are with the absolute experts on this topic. So you can see why I'm so excited. So let me just introduce, we have with us our beloved Dr. Katie Kangas, an integrative veterinarian here from San Diego. Hello, Dr. Kangas. Hello, it's my pleasure to be here as always. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And today we have our special guest, Dr. Holly Gams from Animal Biome. She is the founder and CEO of that amazing organization. We're going to talk much more about it, but really what it's all about, uh, what Animal Biome is all about, is specializing in the diagnostics and therapeutics of dogs and cats for their health. And again, because this is the seat of wellness, it really is the foundation of what all of us who are loving animal companion humans to, you know, loving parents to our companion animals is what I'm trying to say. Any of us that have that relationship and care that much, like this is such a key component and a key conversation. So without further ado, I'll go ahead and just turn it over to Dr. Kangas. She'll explain a little bit more about this and then we'll get going into some of our questions and we'll definitely have time for some of your questions as well. So Dr. Kangas, take us from here. Thank you. Fantastic. So I'm very excited about this topic, too, and to have our discussion today with Dr. Gans, who I met a little more formally several months ago when I brought her system into my practice. And of course, as an integrative veterinarian and, and a holistic practitioner, one of the best ways to support natural healing and well-being and you know preventative health for both animals and humans is to support the immune system. And many people have heard that, you know, beneficial bacteria, of course, are supporting our immune system. And so probiotics have gotten a lot of focus lately, but uh, a lot of people may not understand the extent of the microbiome in the body. And so that's one of the things that we really want to uh, educate people on today. And one of the things that I love to share with my clients is, well, first of all, just to quickly define the, the term microbiome is, referring to this vast ecosystem of bacteria and beneficial microbes, the friendly bacteria that are in the body. And for a quick perspective, that's, you know, sounds very strange, but your, your body and your pet's body, if we count the number of bacteria compared to our own cells, we are more bacteria than human cells and your dog is more bacteria than canine cells. So it gives us a, an understanding of how we are intended to live in harmony with all of these microbes in our body. And we are now learning more through you know, modern medical science that the microbiome is absolutely critically important to so many things, even beyond the immune system, that have to do with every facet of health. And so gut health obviously is obvious and there's so many pets and people that suffer from chronic gastrointestinal diseases. Most people have heard of IBD or inflammatory bowel disease or IBS in people, um, huge problem in dogs and cats. But uh, some people may have also heard of something called the gut brain axis, which is actually the, the term that's used now to describe the relationship between the gut and the brain. And medical science used to think that the brain was number one brain and gut was number two. And now they're saying we've got that reversed. The gut is literally the number one brain because a lot of the neurotransmitters or precursors and things like that that help brain function come from the gut and the microbes. And so literally the, the amount of health aspects that are related to the gut and to the microbiome is extremely vast. So that's really nice to understand. And then the other thing about the microbiome is also knowing that the more diverse, and Dr. Gans can uh, definitely um, extrapolate on this for us and get a little more detailed, but from what I understand, the more diverse the microbiome is, 
um, obviously in a healthy balance, the, the healthier we are as well. So as a holistic practitioner who's very into nutrition, one of the things that I've been recommending for my animal patients for quite a while now is actually eating more fermented foods. And of course, Amanda and uh, I have on Sama Dog presented this a few times to help build the microbiome. And that's a fantastic way through nutrition and food therapy. But now we get to look at this topic today of a whole nother way that we can really help to support the microbiome beyond just food medicine. And this is something that's been done in human medicine for a while and a lot of lives have been saved with uh, fecal transfer and Holly can expand on that. But I've seen some wonderful results already with some of my patients. We can talk a little bit more about that as we go along and maybe I'll turn it over to Dr. Holly and see how she wants to add in some more information at this point. Hi, I'm really thrilled to be here on Sama Saturday. Thank you so much for inviting me. Um, yeah, so I'm all about the microbiome. We got into this. Um, I've been studying sort of microbes and how they interact with animals for like 20 years. It's um, sort of been the folk, a lot of the focus of my career, and but only in the last um, 10 or 15 years did we start thinking about how does it affect health, especially in like companion animals. and um, I wasn't really aware of how common these these gastrointestinal problems are in, in dogs and cats, but um, but I did a I did a Kickstarter to try and fund some academic work I was doing on on I was interested in how the microbiome might be evolving in um, in the animals and how it might differ between like hyenas and lions and things like that. But I um, found it hard to get funding for that research, so I did a Kickstarter where I offered to sequence people's cat poop and. Then all of a sudden, all these people were like, my cat has chronic vomiting or chronic diarrhea. And I and I've tried I've tried the antibiotics and the steroids and the prescription diets and it, it didn't work or, or like I'm still suffering from like it's they're relapsing or they still have the chronic diarrhea. Um, and so it was actually a way for me to re realize that maybe what we were doing in academia could be useful for people. And so I, I started started a company and, and sort of discovered that um, this medical merry-go-round is sort of well known, especially by I think integrative and holistic practitioners who are trying to offer something different. And um and that this testing that we so we offer microbiome testing and it can be used, I think, to guide dietary adjustments to restore balance. Like the question was though about diversity. Um, so um, we have found in a lot of research that having a less diverse microbiome is associated with a number of disease states. Um, of course, as, as um, Dr. Congas mentioned, like having a really diverse microbiome, if it's full of pathogens and parasites is not necessarily good either, right? So within the range of normal, healthy, um, in general, depleted microbiome um, is thought of as being imbalanced and is, is associated with um, a number of chronic health problems. Yep. And, and that's what I've seen, you know, in my patients. Again, like I said, the, the um, frequency that I see uh, GI problems, gastrointestinal problems is, is really, you know, so common amongst dogs and cats. And of course, humans too, when I start talking to people about this for their pets are like, you know, can I get this done for myself? How is this, you know, how does this apply to me? Because so many people have this issue too. So, um, you know, th this is just such a, a great system for people to know about. Yeah, our our um, surveys that we've done indicate that it's about 20% of cats and dogs and people have these chronic GI problems. And then if you add in like the pets with food sensitivities, it's much, it might be even higher. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I bet that sounds right. Mm -hmm. And I just want to invite, just pause a moment and invite anyone that's on the line to bring their questions up, to bring their questions to us. We know that um, 
you know, there's there's many out there. And as you've both shared, the microbiome touches onto so many different parts of our lives. And so please come forward with your questions. We'd love to answer them. We'll continue to on a little more content here, but get them ready for us. And then if anyone on the line is willing to share, of course, we'd be extremely grateful for that because that's the way we spread this. So if you have a network of people that are connected to their animals in a special way as we are, then please just press that share button and help us get this out there because that's why these two ladies take their time, all of us, of course, to take our time to create this opportunity so that we can get the word out on the streets. People need to know, and not everyone has a great veterinarian or physician that they can speak to that guides them in this way. So we hope to be able to be those individuals that can land into your home and inspire and guide you properly. So um, so just a couple questions. Um, Dr. Gans, tell us, how did animal biome start and when did it start? What inspired you? Oh yeah, I mentioned that I had done a Kickstarter to try and fund academic research and it went way better than I expected. Um, I wasn't offering a service, it's just, um, can you support some research? And, um, and that was four years ago. And then I basically started interacting with people about their cats and, um, and found that when I looked at the microbiome for a lot of these cats with the chronic, um, who had either like I diagnosed or suspected IBD or chronic diarrhea or vomiting that a lot of them had really imbalanced and depleted um, compositions of gut bacteria. And when I told them, like, I think you need to, um, like, there's clearly a problem with the microbiome. You should talk to your veterinarian. They were like, what do I do about it? And I said, well, maybe you should ask for a fecal transplant. But a lot of them said that it was too expensive or their veterinarian didn't offer that procedure. So I started the company three years ago in San Francisco. We're based in Oakland now, California. Um, initially to sort of use this as di a diagnostic approach for trying to you know, give something in addition to sort of more invasive endoscopies and other approaches based on sort of non-invasive poop samples that can be collected by people. Um, but then we developed an oral fecal transplant capsule um, because people wanted to fix the problem. We wanna to work towards having microbial cocktails in the future. We're seeking investment for that. Um, but this approach is, is the reason that we did fecal transplants as opposed to probiotics is because these are bacteria and fungi that are native to cats and dogs and aren't in the probiotics on the market today. A lot of the probiotics um, that are used today come from either human infants or um, soil organisms and they can be useful, but they're not the same. And, um, and so if we sort of liken them to they can be a useful band-aid, but they're not going to colonize and take the place of a, a bacterium that um, is sort of foundational for health and helps with you know all of those things from digestion to immune function. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's nice to clarify for people. So just to give people an understanding, a, a probiotic product can be useful, but oftentimes those products don't provide species of bacteria that would be normal inhabitants of a dog gut or a cat gut. And so they're helpful, but they're not gonna repopulate it with a healthy ecosystem or at least a comparable ecosystem to what they should have. Is that right? That's absolutely right. Okay. Um, and, uh, in some, and now we're starting to realize that in, in some cases, like they found more recently with um, like chemotherapy patients and for humans, um, that taking probiotics can alter um, the outcome in ways that isn't um, always good. So now, I mean, when doctors, when oncolo medical oncologists put people on chemotherapy, they're I think a lot more cautious about just recommending that they just use any probiotic. Mm -hmm. it's, mm -hmm. So it's complicated and we're still at the early stages of understanding these interactions. Yeah. So maybe I can um, describe a little bit more too for our viewers that uh, Dr. Gans's system at Animal Biome, you submit a fecal sample from your pet and you get a very extensive report back that lists out numerous bacteria, different species of bacteria that they look at ratios of what they should be in, you know, in the, um, the evaluation and give you a report back of if they're in balance or out of balance, and then make a recommendation to do the fecal transfer capsules, which as she mentioned, there's actually donor stool from healthy 
uh, you know, healthy pets with a nice, diverse, balanced microbiome. And she has freeze dried stool in these capsules that you give orally to your pet. It's a very user friendly, easy system. What we used to do at my practice is the fecal transfer method where we actually would get the donor stool and put it in a blender, <laughs> blend up stool, <laughs> and actually deliver it rectally, kind of like a reverse enema. And albeit that that could be a very functional way to do it, it's pretty high maintenance and the cost is higher. You have to cart your pet in, especially if it's a cat, not the easiest thing to do. And these capsules really provide an incredible way for people to do this simply at home and with wonderful results. And I think the, the results that my patients are getting so far are quite tremendous. And maybe Dr. Holly can tell us, I think I've heard uh, that they have an 80 to 90% success rate. I've just been getting into this system lately, but I'm excited to say that I saw one of my um, patients the other day for a follow-up recheck visit. And this is a kitty whose name is Benjamin and he's a Siamese kitty and he's not even two years old yet. And he was diagnosed with inflammatory bowel disease that was thought to have uh, originated because of a parasite infection when he was a very young kitten. And he had been miserable his whole life of a year and a half with digestive issues, vomiting, diarrhea, chronic, chronic diarrhea. And to the point where his little rectum was inflamed and he was just grouchy, he was grumpy, you know, to, to mom. And she's like, he doesn't want to play. And so anyway, we have been working with him, obviously, with some, you know, different holistic um, uh, supplements. But really, it was the fecal transfer that made such a huge difference. And his mom just told me the other day, she's like, you know, these these fecal transfer capsules have literally been a miracle. She's like his stool and he's happy and he's running around now. He's vibrant. He's gained weight. He's maintaining hydration and playing with the other kitty. And she's like, I can't even tell the difference between their stools anymore. She's like, I'm, I'm just absolutely emphatic about this. She's telling everybody about it. She's on like Facebook on the kitty inflammatory bowel disease group <laughs> and spreading the news. And so it's fantastic. It's, it's going to get out there and this is just a great system. So um, maybe that'll help people understand a little bit more about how that works. Yeah, that's great. That was a, a couple of the questions that we had had was, you know, yeah, basically, how does this work? How does the testing happen? How does the fulfillment happen? How does, you know, how do you read the results and what happens afterwards? Dr. Gans, do you want to add anything to that? Oh, sure. So um, you can either um, buy these items through your veterinarian, like Dr. Congas, or um, you through our website. We definitely recommend conferring with your veterinarian. It's, it, it, it's very helpful for um, understanding the results, but we have basically have a test kit that we can mail to you. And then you basically collect a small fecal sample about a pea sized amount and stick it in a small vial. And then you pop it in a bubble mailer and send it back to us that the vial has a fixative. So it's, it makes the poop stable at room temperature. So you don't have to worry about overnighting it or, um, you know, having it on ice or anything like that. And then when we get the sample, we first, we let you know that we got it. And then we take that into the lab and we extract DNA from it. Then we actually do a series of um, processes to prepare the sample for sequencing. We're using what they call next generation sequencing on the Illumina platform. And we're looking at a marker gene for all known bacteria. So we, it's a discovery based approach because um, that this allows us to find if there's something unusual in your pet sample that you know may not be because we're finding that a lot of these digestive conditions can vary in the underlying cause and so we like to be able to look at all the bacteria and see not just do um like a more traditional veterinary diagnostic test would be looking at a panel of markers for certain groups of bacteria that are um, important but the those panels don't include all of these beneficial bacteria that are, are so important for health. Then we have a report that we'll mail to you. So we all of this happens within about a week. We um, depends on when we get your sample. If we get it early in the week, then you'll get your results in less than a week. If it comes on Friday, then it might take about um, seven business days. 
great. Well, that is definitely, those are the details that a lot of people are asking for. So that's really good to know. Very good to know. And, um, you know, in general, I know every animal is different, but in general, how quickly do people start to see some change? It is variable. So these young animals, like Dr. Congas's um, story about Benjamin, sometimes they really respond in a few days. Like it's, um, so the microbiome that we all have, we get our first exposure to these organisms when we're being born from our moms. But cats are a bit different. They are actually in a, like enveloped in a like, case when they're born, right? So um, if the, and sometimes like cats are born to, to young young moms who are like living outside maybe like with ferals and they can sometimes abandon them. And so the like the orphan kittens or like the, a lot of these young animals can end up just not getting inoculated with the right gut bacteria early in life. And, and, and basically it means that they can't fully process their food and extract the calories and nutrients that they need from it. And if you give them a fecal transplant a lot of them just respond within within less than a week. But if you have a dog or cat with a, who's had who has inflammatory bowel disease that may have a genetic predisposition involved, and it's been going on for years, then it, it can take longer. The system has to heal. Um, it's why it's so critical that it's part of a whole integrative approach to to their health. And um, the then sometimes if it takes you know it can take thirty days. Sometimes even so we have a thirty day protocol for the capsules. And then sometimes people even report seeing improvement in several weeks after they stop the capsules because, um, well, this is how I think about why it might be that way is that we're basically taking a small amounts of, of beneficial gut bacteria from dogs for dogs and cats for cats. And we're seeding the gut. Like, so the gut's like a, the soil and it needs to colonize. And we're doing like a little bit every day and it takes time for these organisms to establish and grow. I mean, I, I don't know how big it is for a dog and cat, but I've heard for humans, the people say that the digestive tract is like the size of a tennis court. If you lay it all out flat, it's a really large surface area and it, it's gonna, it can take some time for these little microbes to get around. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I bet they're they are little bugs that they still need time to travel, right? They still need time to, to do their work. Um, um, Actually, maybe just to help people have an understanding too. I don't know, Dr. Holly, if you have a report of microbiome. I was trying to print out while we were speaking, thinking it might be nice to show people, although they can go to a link and see what a report might look like, just so they get an understanding of when they turn in a fecal sample, what you know, what the reading would look like, how you know the testing is done, and things like that. I think that might be a nice um, example for people to see. I'm gonna see if, I don't have one right next to me, but I'm just gonna see if I can get my husband to bring me one. <laughs> That'd be great. So. Husbands can be great supporters <laughs> in times like this. <laughs> yes. Um, I, uh, cause I don't think, it doesn't look like I can share my screen with this. Okay. Um, right. Yeah, but yeah, I, this platform. Mm -hmm. With this platform. Okay. Um, but okay. um, yeah, and I'm, perhaps maybe we can put one also in the Facebook, um, like maybe I can post something mm -hmm. on your page or in the comments yeah. for this. Yes. It's great. Yeah. So we, um, let's see. He's asking if it were printed. Yes, please. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, so the report, um, it does have a lot of names of bacteria and some like biology refresher it's a, I think a challenge with doing microbiome science for pets is that we have to let people know a little bit of microbiology um, when really probably they just want to know what, what they should do to make them feel better. Um, I don't know what your experience is with your clients, Dr. Congas, but I, I can just sort of explain a little bit about the, we basically, we go through all these different groups of bacteria and try and make some recommendations of things that you can you can do to try and in, improve the balance if if your cat if your dog or cat isn't isn't having like a severe chronic ailment but might just have a little bit of sensitivity or what we consider like a more mild imbalance there's a lot you can do with diet to to improve the composition of gut bacteria things like fiber or um, altering the macronutrients a lot of 
a lot of pet foods don't necessarily have as high of protein amount as we like to think they do because they sort of the labeling doesn't make the amount of carbohydrates in the in the food very clear. I know that there's work to change that, but it hasn't really changed yet. And we can really see in the microbiome if there's too much carbohydrate or um, even like some pets that are on a high protein diet might also not be getting enough fiber. Right, because the, the fibers are helpful with prebiotics, right? To feed the, the beneficial bacteria. So if the diet doesn't have enough components that are gonna feed uh, the microbiome, then you can get deficiency that way as well. And I love the fact that Dr. Holly just brought up food and nutrition and how that's related, because of course that's one of my big focuses. And the first discussion that Dr. Holly and I had in person, I loved how she shared with me. She said, you know, I never had an interest in nutrition and, you know, dietary topics. She goes, I was just, you know, studying bugs my whole life, you know, microbiome and microbiology. And she's like, now I look at poop and I can tell what animals are eating. I can tell if they have too many carbohydrates in their diet. I can tell if they eat raw food versus heavily processed food. And to me, that is not only remarkable, but not a surprise. Mm -hmm. And I think to most veterinarians, that would be a surprise. You know, a lot of veterinarians still think that standard dry food, heavily processed diets are, you know, the most healthy thing for pets. And I'm really jazzed up that Dr. Gans's studies and you know similar scientists like her are finding how related diet is to our microbiome, our beneficial bacteria, and therefore our, our entire health uh, pattern. So I think that's wonderful. So thank you for bringing that up and tying that scope in for people to understand that a bit more. Mm -hmm. No, it's so interesting. And I, I just want to share with everyone because I know there are a lot of people interested on the line to receive the test. So go to the animalbiome.com um, page website. Very clear, by the way, Dr. Gans did a great job of just like making everything very simple. Microbiology is not, you know, second nature to all of us, but you really lay it out there to where it's very understandable, very easy to see like what happens in the testing process. It's all laid out there. And she has been so generous to give all of our participants today, our community, a discount of 20%, which is significant. So I just want to share that. I'll post it down below as well to make sure that everybody has this. But the code for your 20% off of your testing kit from Animal Biome is Kangas-FB. So K-A-N-G-A-S-K-A-N-G-A-S-FB for Facebook. And that'll get you your 20% off. So I'll make sure that I post that down below in the comments, but <laughs> wants to make note of it right now. Um, and um, yeah, we so we have some questions coming in. Is there anything else you want to say before we take some of those questions? Um, uh, you know what, actually, I would love to just add in there uh, briefly too. one of the things that I learned from Dr. Gans and Carlton and their team over there at Animal Biome, which I think I knew a little bit, but really now I have a, a deeper understanding is that most of us know that, of course, every single time our pets or ourselves go on prescription antibiotics, that that is affecting our microbiome. Right. So that's one of the things I, I like to do as much as possible as a you know holistic practitioner is to try to find alternatives to antibiotic therapy for my patients. Um, but one of the things that I wasn't as uh, you know as knowledgeable on is that every there are many other medications that affect the microbiome. So this is really good for pet parents to understand that medications like antacids, which I'm not a big fan of for long-term use for anybody, pet or people, but antacids can affect the microbiome. These are things like Pepsid, Prilosec, Zantac. A lot of dogs are you know, and cats too are prescribed these by their veterinarians for, for very long-term use. And then other medications that affect the microbiome and the gut are uh, NSAIDs, which are the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, such as for dogs, Rimadyl, Carprofen, Medicam, Meloxicam, humans, this would be stuff like ibuprofen and things in that category. Um, and then also prednisone or corticosteroid anti-inflammatories uh, are also affecting the microbiome and the gut. And there are numerous pets 
on those medications very long term for all kinds of situations, especially autoimmune disease or immune re related allergy. And these are all causing more deficiency and disruption of the microbiome. And that's correct, Dr. Gans, right? Anything you want to add to that? Yeah, there was a study that came out earlier this year where they looked at more than a thousand medications, including veterinary, um, those in med veterinary use as well. And a third of them had an effect on beneficial gut bacteria. Wow. So, so we're just really beginning to understand that. Yeah. And so one of the things I learned from the animal biome team is that when you get this report back for your pet and if they are out of balance, which in my experience, most animals are, um, then it's recommended to do the fecal transfer capsules. If they're mildly out of balance, you can do a shorter course, like a, you know, 15 to 30 day course. And if they're dramatically out of balance or have a lot of, you know, uh, pathogenic bacteria or, or something like that, then you can do a longer system, right? 30 to 60 days. But the interesting thing to know is if your pet ever has to go on antibiotics or some of these medications that we just mentioned for a health condition, and really it just seems like, you know, that's the best option and we need to, to use Western, you know, medications that may alter the microbiome, you can, for your pet, do a short course of the fecal transfer capsules for like a seven day course for just kind of a little, um, you know, follow up after a medication. So uh, that's a really neat uh, way to utilize this system as well to uh, just kind of do a nice little reboot or quick start after the body's had to go on medications. Yeah, that's right. Because we what we think is that when you lose that diversity of good gut bacteria, Maybe your you or your pet are still functioning, but then if if you got sick or you had to go on medications or your pet does, that you might be more likely to develop a chronic condition because you don't have the resilience in the system. Okay, it's like the diversity helps protect you from. Um, we call it like in science perturbations or like you know, but something that's like you know, say you do get like. Um, in the case of like a dog, like Giardia seems to cause a massive effect on the microbiome. And then, and I don't know if it's the Giardia, I think it's both the Giardia itself as well as the treatment of it. And then often they seem like they end up with these chronic GI problems afterwards. Actually, I have a wonderful question to ask you, Dr. Gann, speaking of Giardia, because we see that a lot, uh, certainly in my area. And I think, you know, in, in, uh, many locations, veterinarians are diagnosing Giardia all the time. And, uh, you know, I, I always am trying to find alternative solutions to typical medications, <clears throat> excuse me, to treat various things. Are you aware of efficacy in animals or any studies that are out there in treating parasite infections with fecal transfer? So say if a, if a pet has Giardia, is it still indicated to treat with the standard medications and then follow up with animal biome or with a microbiome, you know, fecal transfer? Or are we heading into an area of science or understanding that maybe we can actually treat these things with fecal transfer at some point? Right. That's a gr I mean, that's a really good question. I think we're still trying to do the research for that. I, I, so I'm not as familiar with what are the medications used to treat Giardia. Um, okay. I think where at least more conven conventional veterinary um, research is going is can we do a short course treatment and then follow it with fecal transplant? So maybe we can reduce the period of exposure and you know, hopefully at least reduce the use of antibiotics even if they're still gonna be a tool. Okay, fantastic. Uh, just to, just to let everyone know, the Giardia, one of the most common things used to treat Giardia is metronidazole. Uh, mm -hmm. Flagyl is a brand name that some people may be familiar with. And that is a such a commonly used antibiotic in the veterinary field for any time a dog gets diarrhea. Oftentimes, veterinarians prescribe, you know, metronidazole. Uh, so it's commonly used and definitely for uh, Giardia as well. Uh, it's estimated that a lot of Giardia cases will respond to that, but there's definitely a, a percentage that won't. So a lot of veterinarians will use a combination of metronidazole and another deworming medication called fenbendazole or Panicure and combine those two. And interestingly, I just diagnosed a case of Giardia yesterday 
in my practice and was thinking, gosh, I wish I had an alternative <laughs> to treat. So now I will absolutely recommend to this doggy mom that we follow up with a fecal transfer after that. That would be great. It's fascinating. And I want to give time to our audience as well, but I just have to ask one question the, around animals and the biome because um, Dr. Gans, I don't, we didn't have a chance really to get to know each other yet that well, but I've been with Deepak Chopra now for about almost 15 years and he is really big on the microbiome, as you might know, written many books about it as well and studies it. So what I often hear him talk about is how latest, the, the modern research in the biome is understanding how to influence long-term diseases like Parkinson's or even MS. Is that the same um, findings that they're moving towards with animals? Yeah, I mean, in fact, I think that this longevity work would be even better suited for our pets because they age so much faster than we do. I think, I mean, dogs do get dementia. I don't think know if there's something equivalent with Parkinson's or Alzheimer's, but um, yeah, so people are looking, I mean, and I've talked to plenty of veterinarians who are thinking about this for themselves because their family have a history of these. And so there's diets that people are trying to do. I mean, if there isn't a way, there's no cure, right, for Alzheimer's, but so we want to be proactive and do everything we can to be as healthy as possible. And we, there's a lot of research showing that having, that Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and also like even a children with autism have altered microbiomes and yes. that providing dietary support may actually help alleviate symptoms. Even if it's not causal, it can still be a helpful approach. Yeah. And this, this gut brain access that I referred to, you know, in the, in the beginning of our session is exactly related to what Dr. Holly was just talking about is so many brain disease conditions have been linked to a deficient microbiome or an out of balance microbiome. So that is huge. And one of the other things that has caught the attention, I think in the human uh, medical uh, aspect is that weight management is also linked to microbiome, mm -hmm. right? So they have found that people who have a tendency toward obesity have a very deficient or out of balance microbiome. And they've actually done studies in mice and in humans and perhaps other species that I'm not uh, aware of the studies, but where they've taken samples of the microbiome out of a thin mouse or person and given that to an obese mouse or person and they lose weight mm -hmm. and yeah. vice versa. Yeah. So it's literally your microbiome and your bugs are helping to, you know, set your metabolism mm -hmm. as well as so many other functions that are going on in the body and your brain and your your hormonal systems and, you know, all these biochemical facets that are being influenced by your microbiome. It's, it's beyond fascinating, but yeah, so it's being looked at for weight management. And now people are literally trying to take their probiotics to, you know, help, help that aspect too. Cause obviously that's a, a huge motivation for a lot of people anyway. So, yeah. But a lot, of, a lot of pets are obese too. So, I mean, that's mm -hmm. something really to be considering in that regard as well. Was and, it 56% of dogs or something like that are, are overweight or obese? Wow. Yeah, yeah and, and yeah. The, um, the microbiome responds to sort of um, diets and that's why, you know, you can lose weight for a couple of weeks and then it slows down because it, the bacteria are actually able to shift and extract more calories from your food. Hmm. And um, I think what's also really interesting is that if the system doesn't respond that way, it actually, can, I think, can be a sign of some like an underlying issue with with the with your health, like your your pancreas isn't functioning right, then you won't see the right shift. Mm -hmm. This is actually protective, like the the body's yeah. trying to, to help us survive starvation or you know periods of food limitation. Fascinating. It's a whole world in there. And I, I am very interested in how it, it uh, relates to behavior in our dogs and, and I'm sure cats yeah. and all animals and human beings. Maybe this is uh, something to really look into with the aggression, tension, stress, you know, the intensity that many humans are facing. But I read a study and I'll actually be sharing this with our group. We have a course that's running right now, a seven week online course called Total Wellbeing for Dogs. Dr. Kangas just spoke this week at in that. And what we're going to be sharing with people is research, I think it was done last year about aggression, dogs, aggressive dogs and microbiome and 
direct link that was proven. So just knowing that it's it's altering, it's influencing, I should say, every single aspect, even how you act and how you think is totally fascinating. Right. And you think about, you know, human children growing up, you know, today and, and how uh, prevalent ADD and ADHD Gosh, and, yeah. you know, brain fog and focus problems and all this kind of thing. And you think about the modern American sad, the standard American diet and how, you know, that is lending to problems, more problems and deficiencies with the microbiome and, you know, how this is affecting new generations and cultures and, and everyone. It's, mm -hmm. it's really an impactful uh, situation that we should be aware of. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's take a couple questions because as excited as we are, I'm sure all of our viewers are too. <laughs> we won't forget about you all on the line. I'm watching you and I'm with you. Uh, so let's see here. Um, uh, let's see, there was one that I wanted to share. Oh, many more have come up since. So, okay, we'll get to this. But I wanted to share this first because I found it interesting that Karen, who must be a patient of yours, Dr. Kangas, is that right? She said the report that is sent back after the initial poop sample that is sent in is crazy, amazing what they find out. Yeah, Karen, I'm Karen, we'll have a thing to show, but yeah, it, it's, it's extensive and it's all yeah. in color. It's really, it's really helpful. Um, you know, they they give uh, samples of what normal should look like and then where your pet falls in and there's graphs and uh, a bar graph even to show. And, and by color, you can tell if anything that's in like a brighter color, like a pink or an orange or something like that, that's kind of like a flag, like warning, <laughs> these bacteria aren't supposed to be here. So when they're they're non, not normal bacteria that are found in your you know, pet system, then they're in these brighter colors in this little graph uh, that shows up on the results pages. And, um, and then each uh, uh, type of bacteria that they're, that they're looking at in the evaluation, they give a percentage and then what a normal percentage for a, a healthy adult dog would be and then you get to see the comparison and so in many pets and what i've seen in my patients is that there are numerous bacteria that will show up as zero percent and then others obviously that are much higher than they're supposed to be or uh, of course bacteria that are not even supposed to be there that are there so it's a very useful report to really get an idea of uh, the balance of the system and it's explained very nicely but it can be a lot of uh, information as Dr. Gann said it can be a lot of information for the average pet parent so it's nice to have a veterinarian who is versed in this to help uh, you through the interpretation of it but it's it's definitely a, a very useful report for anybody to be looking at to get an understanding of what's going on for their pet. And um, I want to add that we we um provide a free phone consultation. So if you want to go over your report and have any questions, just you can give us a call or email us at team at Animal Biome or call us. Um, the number should be on the report and we are happy to, to go through it with you in addition to talking to your veterinarian. That's great. So comprehensive. It's just amazing. And I'm seeing here on our a conversation that someone was asking, Mary was asking, how do I administer these capsules to my dog, my 12 pound dog, because they fight everything. And some of our other participants, our community members are giving feedback. Yeah. <laughs> Mary, what she did with some peanut butter, some liverwurst also works, someone said. So yeah, Karen was saying that she, um, you know, I'll pull this question up here. Um, so will or could the behavior change in a dog after six, 30 to 60 days? So just keep in mind for our viewers, Karen is doing is in the process of the fecal transplant now. So, yeah, I mean, so a lot of people do report behavioral changes. I mean, as you can imagine, if you um, have either like um, a lot of gut health problems, you're probably not feeling too good all the time. I mean, it's very unsettling to have. That's why we talk about like, you know, the, your gut. Um, going with your gut and like just we know how unsettling it is when you have an upset stomach but and also if they just have like terrible skin conditions too I mean they just there's a lot of sort of stressed out anxiety and um, aggressive behavior that can arise from being sick like that and when if it if it resolves that or the whole the holistic approach of resolves it then they they are more playful they're more relaxed it's just amazing to see the transformation 
How nice is that? I'm sure. And the, the pet parents, you know, not only is your dog feeling better physically and going to, you know, improve and live longer and all of those things, you know, that we're wishing, but they're happier and they're more joyful and they're more peaceful. So there's nothing more than we would want. So Cynthia is asking, best way to treat arthritis in older dogs to avoid Rimadyl or Gabapentin? Mm, well, that's a, a little bit of a different top, topic than the microbiome, but definitely since we mentioned obesity, I'll say that keeping your pet lean is one of the best ways to treat arthritis. There's a lot of natural uh, food, you know, remedies and food medicine that can take the place of, uh, can be more effective than using medications like Rimadyl and Gabapentin. So those are the kinds of things that I would recommend. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then our topic of CBD, which we've covered a few times in the past too, is a, is another nice alternative option that can be very useful for uh, inflammation and pain for just about anything, including arthritis. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that, Dr. Kangas. And then Trish is asking, would this test be helpful um, with, for food sensitivities? Yes, actually, we find that a lot of food sensitivities may be an indi indication that there are sort of what we consider like the core gut bacteria that are important for digestive function may be missing or may just not be present in enough abundance to, to help the gut process the food. And, um, and so we don't think a lot of them are, or well, many of them are not a true allergy, but are actually an indication of something missing in the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so Dr. Gans, I think this, oops, I tapped on the wrong one. Um, <laughs> we'll just answer this real quick. Can I use CBD with the capsules? I think so. Yeah, a lot of people have, and I mean, we want it, we're going to be doing research to look at how, uh, how the inclusion of CBD oil might um, improve outcomes or like what the effects are. So in the next year, we'll be launching some studies on that. And, I, and I'm actually glad someone asked that because I was going to tag that on the end of my comment. And CBD should be something that should not disrupt the microbiome as far as I know. I mean, we have our own and your pet has their endocannabinoid system called, you know, the ECS for short, where their body makes their own cannabinoids. And so that is a very natural substance in the body. And there are studies done in dogs, as well as I'm sure humans, about the benefits of CBD in the GI tract. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that is a really nice alternative that should not uh, disrupt the, the natural processes of the microbiome or the gut, as far as I'm aware. So great question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's perfect that it came up. Mm -hmm. um, so I think a great place to end this, and it kind of ties into a few questions that we have anyways, is, um, you know, of course, the testing is fabulous and the information that we're able to access is, is key. Um, and knowing that in general, keeping our pets microbiome healthy, what are like the top three things that pet parents should be doing or could be doing? I don't know, Dr. Rao, I, I would love, and, and actually Dr. Gans can give uh, her take on this, but one of the things that I really like to recommend, well, first of all, avoid antibiotics and medications a, as much as possible and you know, alternatives and, and food therapy and things like that. I love to recommend fermented foods and maybe Dr. Gans can expand on that for us as to what are the, the assets of a fecal transfer versus fermented foods, how much power do fermented foods have in shifting the microbiome, you know, versus other, other um, options. And, uh, and then the other neat thing to talk about to promote microbiome, which I actually love, it's in the report that Animal Biome sends back, is some helpful tips about general lifestyle that also support healthy uh, ecosystem of, of beneficial bacteria in the body. And that is they have little notes like keep your pet hydrated, stay hydrated, uh, you know, exercise, you know, those kinds of things. And from a um, natural nutrition standpoint, by the way, one of the things that I really like to promote is to uh, encourage people to, to move their pets away from traditional, heavily processed dry food. And again, that's dry food. And so staying hydrated is such a good thing for everyone's body. And pets that eat dry food every single day as the main format of their diet, 
especially cats, because they don't typically drink enough to make up for the fact that they eat dry food, whereas dogs will slurp down a bunch of water and it's still a chore for their body to stay hydrated when they're eating a desiccated food, but it's very difficult for cats to keep up with that. And that might be one of the reasons that there are an extraordinary amount of kitties getting inflammatory bowel disease and all these bowel problems. But so anyway, those would be, would be my tips is, uh, you know, stay hydrated, uh, eat fermented foods, exercise and see if Dr. Gans can expand on that for us at all. Yeah. Also, of course, chronic kidney disease is probably also really related to that for cats oh, as well. Absolutely. Absolutely. But I think the thing everybody can do is take a good look at the food that you're feeding, just like um, Dr. Kanga said, and um, make sure that it has enough protein and that it isn't too high in carbohydrates. I feel like that's really common and it's like the, the food manufacturers are really tricky about it. So if you need any help interpreting what um, the, the, the composition, the macronutrient composition of your food is, give us a call too. We're happy to, to translate those labels for you. We're going to be putting a good calculator on our website because it should be easier for everybody to be able to know how many carbs and how much protein they're giving their, their pet. And yeah, reducing the use of antibiotics, of course. And, but um, I'm not a doctor, so I can't, you know, really speak to the medication side of things, but we all know that antibiotics do cause unintended harm to good gut bacteria. And so minimizing them when possible is really advisable. Mm -hmm. Really, it's so it's just so interesting, all of this, and, and it's so comprehensive and I just love it. You know, it, it really lends itself to an understanding of ourselves and our animals that is, when we say holistic and we consider all the things outside of us and inside of us, like just seeing that there's this whole, um, this, I want to say cosmos, it's a whole microcosm happening within us that is then reflected out in everything that we do and everything that we are and how we feel. Um, it's interesting, another something that I often will think about is the exchange of microbiome or the sharing of microbiome between us and our animals that we share our house with. How oftentimes like your hands or your whatever's, you know, are being shared and I'm sure that the microbiome in part is uh, exchanged there. So mm -hmm. that's just an interesting way of understanding that there are no boundaries between us, that we're actually sharing a lot with the beings around us. <laughs> yeah, what's interesting is it seems like we share more with dogs than cats. I'm not sure why that is, because I think people spend a lot of time petting their cats too. Mm -hmm. But they may be a little bit more different than us, yeah. especially in terms of diet. Mm -hmm. Well, this has been so great. I thank you both very, very much for all of your time and your purpose in this world, all that you've put out and all that you've shared and all the animals that you've healed, I'm sure is absolutely countless, especially with both of you on the line. So thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all those, those steps that you've taken and all the energy that you've put in and the Dharma that you've served. And um, I will put up again, more information on Animal Biome below. I'll make sure the link is there and your discount code is there um, and any information, um, any questions that we can come back to, we will. And um, I just wanna turn it over to either of you for any closing thoughts and then we'll wrap it up for today. Thank you. Um, only closing thought that, uh, or, or one more piece that I wanted to mention is that when uh, Holly was talking about the composition, I think that's great that you offer. I didn't realize that people can contact you and get an analysis of the diet they're feeding. I think that is a fantastic service that you're offering. So I wanted to thank you for that and also you know, just clarify for people that that is something that I would definitely put to use. And I may recommend that for some of my clients as well. Uh, there's a lot of confusion with pet parents, especially right now with this whole, you know, grain free. And I do tend to um, help explain for people that marketing can be very misleading. And even if they are choosing a grain free food for their pets, it can still have a lot of carbohydrate content in it. And that can definitely alter a lot of things in the body, but including the microbiome as we're talking about today. So I think that's a nice clarification for people to understand. And I'm really glad that that's something that the animal biome team is not only looking at, but willing to help people to assess that for their specific pets. So mm -hmm. that's wonderful. 
It's just interesting, isn't it? I don't mean to interrupt you, Dr. Gans. I want you to have the final thoughts, but I do find it interesting, and I know we've said it, but that carbohydrates carbohydrates are not listed on a dog food bag. Like that's just odd. I think that most people don't even notice that. I didn't notice it until that was brought to my attention. And is that because they don't have to, right? Like there, the there's not really a requirement to list carbohydrates. So you that's have right. to calculate it yourself. Which who's doing that? <laughs> Well, I mean, I do that, be, but so few people do that. And it can be very confusing to do yeah. those calculations with dry matter basis versus, you know, and, and you know, protein on paper can be different mm. from digestible protein that the body's actually able to assimilate as well. Mm. So, you know, reading labels is beyond what most people, and, and they can be misleading, even if you are have a good awareness about these sorts of things. So it is a a difficult thing for people to navigate through for their pets to be a best, the best advocate for their pets. Mm -hmm. So yeah, again, just what a great resource animal biome can be in so many levels. So yeah. Dr. Gans, please go ahead and share any final thoughts you have or anything else you'd like our audience to know. Oh, I just really wanna thank the whole community. I mean, I'm a lifelong animal lover and like all of you and getting to spend this part of my career or maybe the rest of my career working with people who love their pets and want the best for them and have them live the healthiest, happiest lives is the, is the best thing I could imagine spending all of my time doing. And I just feel so honored to be able to interact with people about Thank their pets. You. Yeah. Thank you. We appreciate we love it. it. We love it. All right, ladies, thank you so much. Thank you to all of you that were on the line. Thank you for those that are sharing it, willing to just get the word out about this conversation. All of our Sama Saturdays, we're just looking to make the world for the animals an even better place. So thank you both for your love and devotion. And we will be in touch soon. Namaste, friends. Yeah, namaste. Namaste. Bye-bye. <laughs>